So today I'm going to be talking about Rapid Drive. This is the project I've been working on for the past two or three months. Rapid Drive is our cloud storage solution. We have actually been working on it for years, but we are yet to release a public version. So during the course of my work, I had to implement both file storage and permissions. So there are many different ways of implementing this, and I read about many different design philosophies. The one that we have implemented finally is Unix. So that's what I'll be talking about today, how Unix manages file storage and permissions underneath the hood. In Frappe, we often have this very common quote, everything is a doc type, even a doc type. You might have heard of it if you've worked in the Frappe framework. Similarly, in Unix, everything is actually a file. We think that there's a separate folder, a separate symbolic link, but it's not like that. A folder is a file, a file is a file, of course. Even devices are files, standard input, standard output, everything is a file in, in the Unix world. So this, at first, might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but when you think about it, it's actually very smart. And it's the same reason we have everything as a doc type in Frappe. It makes things so much simpler. We can have the same uniform actions, because ultimately everything's the same, right? A file and a folder has a parent entity. You move files and folders, you delete them. For actions that are specific to a certain file type, like folders, for example, if you want to upload files to a folder, you can just check that file type and then have specific actions to them. But most actions are common between all of these types, so we just have a common type and we call it file. So it's much simpler to understand. It has, we can have uniform actions without specific methods and specific classes for different types. It just makes things so much easier. So that's why Unix does it, and that's what we do now on Frappe Drive 2. So let's talk a little bit more about how files are stored underneath the hood in Unix. So as users, we see a tree, right? We see, for example, this is the documents folder. We see folders, we see files underneath, uh, inside folders. How do you think it's stored underneath the hood? Does anybody have any idea? You can speak up. Do you think it's stored as a tree? And? Okay, so it's stored as a database table, and where's the file stored then? Exactly, so that's very similar. So the file content is actually stored just in the disk separately. And separately, like you say, it's not a database table exactly. It's more like just a table. It's not really a database under the hood. It's something called an inode table. So that's what we're going to be talking about now. Before that, let's look at a seemingly unrelated problem. When you create a file, you have the contents of a file, right? Whatever you put inside it. But where do you store metadata about the file? Where do you store the file name, for example? We know that the file name is not part of the content. Where do you store the owner of the file, permissions, and things like that? So the way Unix solves this is very simple. We store the file content in the file system, like he says, just on the disk. And we have a separate, not a database record, but a record in a table with all the metadata. We have the name, we have the permissions, the owner, and everything else that you might want. And importantly, we have a pointer to that file on disk. So it's when you open a file, really, so this pointer is not actually a database table. It's known as an inode table. Inode just stands for index node. So an inode stores all the metadata about a file, and the file is actually stored separately on the disk. So this is how an inode looks underneath the hood. We have the file type, which is like it could be a directory, it could be a normal file, it could be a symbolic link. We have the permissions, we have owner, and we just have like general metadata, right? Timestamps is just a collection of four important timestamps, when it was created, when it was last updated, when it was last accessed, things like that. And the things at the bottom, the most important ones, are the data blocks, which are actual pointers to the file on the actual disk. So let's speak a bit about this first field we see up there, file type. So in Unix, actually seven types of files. We have, of course, the first one, the normal file. Then we have directories, we have symbolic links, and we have a couple others. The great thing is I said that everything is a file, right? So even devices, like when you connect a printer or a Bluetooth device, even that is stored as a file underneath the hood. That's known as a special file, type six. So when you open a file, it doesn't actually immediately go to disk. What it does, what the kernel does underneath the hood is, it first obtains the inode number, or it goes to the database and finds that relevant file. After finding that inode, it sees the pointer in the inode and then goes to the disk. So it first checks whether you have the permissions for that file, it first checks whether the name of the file aligns with the file you want to open, and after checking everything, only after that does it actually go to the disk using the pointers. So let's have a demo quickly. We'll see how So let me create a file. We can check out the inode numbers using the LSI command. So we can see that the inode number of this file, for example, is a first.txt is 172. And you can see the complete inode too. 
using the stat x command. So here's the inode. We have the file name. We have the size of the file. We have the file type, which is seen as a regular file. We have the mode, which is just a fancy name for permissions. We have the group ID. And we have all sorts of different data that is not actually part of the file, but it, that is important for the file system to know before you actually access the file. So let's, for example, look at the inode of a directory. We see that everything is the same. It has a size field. It has a permissions field. Everything else is the same, except that the file type is a directory. So this is how it is underneath the hood. Let's also quick, quickly create a symlink. OK. And let's see the inode for that symlink. So we see that, again, everything is similar. It has a file name. It has a size. Everything is the same, except that the file type is a symbolic link instead of a normal file. So this is how Unix does it. And this is how we do it, too, in Frappe Drive. So we store the file directly on the disk. But it's stored flat. It's not stored as a tree. So when you open up Frappe Drive, you see a tree of folders and files and teams and things like that. But underneath, none of that is stored. It's just one flat array of files. And then we have a drive file doc type, which somewhat acts like a inode. So it stores permissions. It, shows, it stores the location of the file on the disk so that when you access it, it goes to the disk and reads it. It stores the structure, like the folder, the parent, and all of that. All of that is in the database, not on the actual disk. So when you open a file in Drive, for example this, right? When you open a file through the tree view, what it does, it first gets that inode, if you will. In this case, it's a 0vs6 number, right? It gets that inode. In this case, it actually is the database, because it's a doc type here. So it opens up the database, finds checks if you have the permissions, because that's in the metadata, and then finds the pointer to that file on disk, and then only opens it. So we have basically copied over the Unix model, because it's great, and it's been working for like 40, 50 years. OK, so I'm going to speak a little more, a bit more about inodes. The thing in Unix is disk blocks, you might know, have fixed size. When you say that it's a file system, the disk is actually divided by the kernel into many fixed size blocks, which is generally 4 kilobytes. And the inode is also a fixed size. So let me show this thing, right? We have this inode. We have a file type. We have permissions. But this whole structure is also a fixed size. So the number of pointers per inode is limited. It can be whatever, but it's definitely limited. So let's see. Let's say, for example, that the number of pointers in one inode is a maximum of 16. And the disk block is only 4 kilobytes. So let's say now we have an 8 kilobyte file, right? What do we do? In an inode, the first thing links to the first data block. And the second pointer links to the second data block. And that works. But we have disk blocks of size 4 kilobytes. And we only have 16 pointers per inode. So the maximum file size that you can store using one inode should be 64 kilobytes, right? Because it's only 4 kilobytes into 16, comes 64. So how do we store large files? Does anybody have an idea? Again, I can show you the diagram. We have an inode. It, it has pointers linking to the file on disk. But the problem here is disk blocks are limited. The, f the size of the inode is also limited. So if you want to have a large file using one inode, what do you do? Point, what do you mean? Pointers for the next block. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what I know does underneath the hood is it stores a reference to the reference. So instead, so here we store directly, we have a direct link to the data block, right? But what actually happens is it stores, so let's look at this, right? The first 11 pointers are direct disk references, pointers. But the 12th pointer is actually not a pointer to the disk. It's a pointer to an array which internally has a list of pointers. So this is known as an indirect block for an inode. And in some cases, when the file size is really big, you might also use double indirect blocks or triple indirect blocks. So it just has a recursive sort of structure, so to speak. So in one inode, you can store a virtually unlimited file size. It's not actually unlimited, but for most practical purposes, it's, it's really large. So that's how Unix solves this problem, too. <laughs> and the next thing is the array of inodes is also a fixed size. So what we call the inode table of the database of metadata, that is also a fixed size. So maybe in one given file system, maybe you can have like maybe a couple million inodes. That's it. So when you, when you finish them, what happens, right? Let's say we want to create more than a million files. That is theoretically not possible on one file system. So again, Unix's clever solution. It has multiple file systems underneath the hood. But when you open up Finder on your Mac or whatever, Files Explorer, Unix somehow combines, together, uh, combines them together and shows them as a unified tree. But underneath the hood, it's all separate file systems. So we can actually see that now. There is. 
So I'm going to look at the file systems on my Mac. So you can use the df command. We see that we have so many, almost 10 file systems, right? And this is the only one that's actually being used. So this, my computer is relatively new, so we can see that only 4% of the inos have been used. But when this disk finishes off, Unix will start using another file system, but I'll never know that. I can only see the finder, and I think that's all one unified file system, but it's actually not like that underneath the hood. So before I move on, let's just look at this one, right? This is kind of interesting. It is, it has 100% capacity, which means that all of the inodes are done, and we can see that the available inodes are actually zero. And this file system is mounted on slash dev. Let's just go into that and look what it, it is, what it's about. Does anybody have guesses for what slash dev might be? <laughs> exactly, so dev stands for devices. So like I said, everything is a file, even devices. So in this file system, it stores all the devices as files. So let's look at it. We can see that the Bluetooth incoming port is actually a file, it's stored as a file with an IDO number of 701. We see that all the disks, let me just rerun the df command. We see here disk S, uh, 1s3, 1s1, right? Even they are actually implemented as files underneath the hood. You can see them here. Let's look at a couple of other interesting ones. We can see that standard error, standard input, standard output, all of them are actually just files. So this is an interesting one, u random. We can just read it like a normal file. We think that random number generation is a process or something like that. But in the Unix world, because it's still a file, we can use the head command and just read 15 characters of u random. We'll convert it to base 64. And we just get 15 random characters like that just by reading a file. And let's try, for example, to read three characters from standard input. I can type in, so standard input is actually a file. I'm giving the contents of the file, so to speak. And head reads from the file and gives me only three characters here. So this is really cool. Dev is actually a file system made up of special files, which again are just normal files, but they have a file type of special file. And this, even though it's a separate file system, when we interact with Unix or Linux or whatever, it's all part of the root. We don't actually see that it's a separate file system, even though it is, we can see that by DF. So this is another of the very cool things Linux does to save you the hassle of figuring out its problems of fixed size and all of that. It manages all of that for you. So this is all very related. If I want to summarize it, this is how Unix looks at it. It has entirely two separate types of file system, a lower file system and an upper file system. So the lower file system does actually knows nothing. It's just the I know table, if you will. It's a database table and the disk. It doesn't know file names, it doesn't know path, it doesn't know any of that. And the upper file system has the name of the file and the tree structure, and that uses a special file to store the name and the path of the file. So let me give you an example. Let's say I open up this, right? I go to Macintosh SD, I'm, I'm in a root, and I'm going to the applications folder. So what I see here is inside my first, inside my Macintosh disk, I'm going to the applications folder. But what the kernel sees, what the lower file system sees is just one inode number. So how does it get that inode number from this name applications? So that's what the upper file system does. And this is done using a middleman function known as the name I function. So it takes in a complete path, for example, users, Safon documents, files, whatever, right? And it returns the inode number. And the way it does this is by splitting up the path, so to speak. So it splits up this path and it first goes into users and it finds the inode of that folder. And it checks if I have read permission on that. If I do, then it checks the next one. And sequentially, and it finally gets to the last one. And when it, when it reaches the end character, the null character, it returns the inode number of the last file. So this is actually a very pretty way to do it. The inodes, inodes have nothing to know about the structure. It doesn't have to worry about path. You can move it and the inode number doesn't change. I can show you that, for example. Uh -huh. CD. Can you please zoom it? Yeah. Is it clear? Let's make a directory. Yes. And we'll move the... F So we can see that the inode number of first dot text is 17205085, right? Let's just move first dot text into the test folder. And then we will look at. So we can see that the inode number is still the same. That's because it's part of the lower file system. It doesn't care where it is on disk. It doesn't care about the parent. It doesn't care about anything. This number is always constant. So that's the advantage of using a system like this. We have some exciting news. 
So we have been working on Frappe Drive for almost three or four years. We have never had a public instance. But today, officially, Drive has been launched. So, so this is our first consumer-facing app. You probably know that all our apps, ERP Next, all of that, you have to go to Frappe Cloud and then add that app. But this one, you can just go and sign up directly, like Google Drive. So you can go to the URL, drive.frappe.io. You can scan that QR code. Please come to me for feedback. Okay, thank you very much. Please let me know if you want anything.